Well, thank you, Alice Ann. Thank you, Andrew, for praying. Thank you, Tim and family, for being here and providing us with that report. You will continue to be in our prayers. Thank you, Winnie and Praise Band. Thank you, all those working with the Lasnowskis and, and those working with Bridges and so many doing so much. Some of you out front, some of you behind the scenes, we appreciate everything that you do for the ministry of this part of the body of Christ. Well, Jesus preached a sermon. And it's found in the book of Matthew, and it's sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. And while he was on this mount, which we think is near the Sea of Galilee, he shared something called the Beatitudes. And that actually goes back to the Latin term for what was being said there. But what he said is, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see the kingdom of God. And then he said something else that seems counterintuitive to us. He said, blessed are those who mourn. And we're going to actually spend a couple of weeks in Esther 4, but this morning we're going to talk about that phrase of Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn in the context of Esther 4. So here is our passage of scripture. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, and uh, while well, all that had been done, let me pause for just a moment there. All that had been done is Xerxes deposing his queen, looking for a new queen, bringing women in from across the empire so that they could spend a night with him and he could pick the one he liked best. He picked Esther, a cousin of Mordecai. And then Mordecai refuses to honor Haman on his way out of the palace one day. Haman decides that in order to get even with Mordecai, he's not just going to come after Mordecai. He's going to destroy all of the Jewish people. So he goes to the king with a plan. He says, I want to destroy the Jews. They're rebellious. They're evil. And if you let me do this, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of money, which... Presumably, he's going to plunder from those people he killed or the possessions they have to leave behind when they run away. So the king says, great, go ahead, not a problem. Here's my signet ring. Do whatever you have to do. So that is the background for when Mordecai learned that all, had, that had, when Mordecai learned all that had been done. Okay? There's our background. Mordecai and Esther are Jews. Haman is coming after them. Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. And he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes." When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathra, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. And then Mordecai, <clears throat> and, then, and they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. 
And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Sus, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for your word to us. I pray, Lord, that you will help me to proclaim your message. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help all of us here to understand the place that mourning has in our lives and what it should lead us to. And dear Heavenly Father, I pray if there's anyone here struggling in their relationship with you, struggling to know you, that through the power of your word and the power of your spirit, you will reveal yourself to them, even as I hope and pray you will reveal yourself to all of us, and we will all leave here closer to you, or perhaps even knowing you for the first time. And it's in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, one thing we see in this passage that I think we can all understand is that mourning is a fact of life. It happens. And we see the effects of mourning here. Mordecai tore his clothes. He wears sackcloth and ashes. The other Jews wear sackcloth and ashes. He cried. He mourned. Fasting is mentioned three times. Weeping and lamenting are each mentioned once. Mourning happens. And we see mourning happening throughout Scripture, so we understand that it must happen in our own lives as well. And one reason we mourn is because of calamity. That's what's going on right here, right? The Jewish people have just been told they're going to get annihilated if they stay within the confines of the Persian Empire. So they are in deep mourning because even if they run, they can only take so much with them. They, they have lives, they have friends. What is going to happen? So they are in mourning. And there are lots of times we read about mourning because of calamity in Scripture, but I think one of the most descriptive phrases we have in Scripture comes to us from Joel 1.8. And this is in the context of Joel talking about the day of the Lord, and he's comparing it to a locust plague that has come in and completely destroyed the nation. And he says in Joel 1.8, Weep like a bride dressed in black, mourning the death of her husband. We sometimes mourn that way because of the calamities that befall us in our, our own lives, the calamities that we see happening in the world. So many are mourning because of, say, what's happening in the Ukraine right now. Mourning happens. We also mourn because of the sin of others. There's an example in Ezra 10. Ezra sees the people of Israel joining in marriage with people from other nations. And the problem isn't the ethnicity of the other people. The problem is that they're worshiping other gods. And God continually warns us about that in Scripture, particularly the ancient Israelites. You know, and he warned the kings in a special way said, if you start bringing these other women and you're marrying women from other nations, your heart is going to go astray. And we see that it does go astray in case after case after case. And that's what Ezra is worried about here, that the, the, the devotion to the God of Israel was going to fade away and be replaced by idolatry. And this is what we read in Ezra 10.6. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehoanan, the son of Eliashib, where he spent the night neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. Let me ask you this. Do we mourn over sin? I didn't ask, do we get angry over sin? That seems to be the prevailing attitude right now. We see people whether they're Christians or non-Christians out in the world, doing things that we are nowhere against the Bible. And we seem to be very eager and take it, find it very easy to get angry about that, right? But do we actually mourn over the sin that we see rather than just 
getting angry and upset. Now, we're warned in Scripture to watch our attitudes when it comes to sin. And in particular with regard to fellow Christians who are caught up in sinful behavior, we're warned in Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be, gen- be tempted. The warning there is, watch out. It's very easy to get angry at somebody else over their sin, but we're supposed to feel for them. We're supposed to mourn over them. We're supposed to restore them in a spirit of gentleness because we could get caught up in that same type of behavior, and we have to understand that. So don't just be angry. Be compassionate. Be gentle. And even looking at the outside world, we're warned rather than to just be angry that we need to mourn over sin. And one of the reasons is because we used to be that way. We used to be separated from God. We used to be alienated from the promises. There, the outsiders, the non-Christians, the unbelievers, are behaving the way they're supposed to, behaving, in fact, the way we used to behave. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians 6.11. After going through a, uh, a category, a litany of sins, Paul says, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We were that way. So don't just be angry. Mourn. Mourn because people need to know God. Mourn because people need to follow God. Mourn because some people don't know any better. Mourn because a fellow believer has gotten caught up in something and they need to repent and turn back to God. Don't just be judgmental. Don't just be angry. Mourn. Mourning is appropriate in those types of situations. And then we also mourn because of death in this life. I mean, who hasn't, right? But we see it over and over again in Scripture, particularly with a a national or religious leader who dies. In 1 Samuel 25, 1, now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. And then in Deuteronomy 34, 8, and the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. We could go on and on and on. But I do want to say one thing about mourning, even though we understand that mourning for death is pretty universal. That we who are believers, when we mourn the loss of somebody who is also a believer, it's supposed to be different. We're told this, in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. This is in regard to those who have um, passed away and have died and tied in with the rapture and everything else. But, but there's a significant point that's important here. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others, who do, who others, as others do who have no hope. You know, sometimes I've memorized some of these verses in a different translation, and it can be awfully hard just reading the words in front of me because my brain wants to go somewhere else. So don't grieve as others, who, who others do who have no hope. Okay? Don't do it. Because we have hope. Hope because we understand that we know we're going to see them again. So even though we grieve and we mourn for those who have passed away because we miss them, we miss our, we're going to miss our relationship with them, we miss having them in our lives, we don't mourn as those who have no hope if they are believers as well because we know we are going to see them again. And then, you know, in addition to mourning over the sin of others, we mourn because of our own sin. This is what we read in James 4, 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. There is nothing more humbling for a believer for them to realize they've been engaging in sin and to realize that they have fallen short 
and not followed God the way they were supposed to, and that they have to come back to him and repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. Forgive me. Let me feel the closeness of your presence again. And I say there's nothing more humbling than that because we should know better because we know God. We know what he's done for us through Jesus Christ. We understand the sinfulness of our lives before. We understand what we've been forgiven of. We understand the great sacrifice Jesus Christ made when he left heaven, came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross and became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He died for us. We were condemned. He took the punishment so that we could be forgiven so that we could stand before a holy and righteous God again. We understand all of that, and yet we still sin. Horrible. But note that we come to God initially because we mourn over our sin as well. We understand that we've done wrong in his sight. We understand that we need to be forgiven. We understand our need for Jesus Christ. And Paul says this, In 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Godly grief is understanding we're sinners. Godly grief is understanding we need a Savior. Godly grief is going to God and repenting, acknowledging our sinfulness, believing in Jesus Christ. That leads to salvation without regret. Worldly grief, just grieving about the things of this world, grieving because we don't have what we want, grieving because life isn't what we think it should be, doesn't lead to salvation. We have to understand we're sinners in need of salvation. We have to understand we're sinners in need of grace. We have to repent of the wrong that we've done and believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So the mourning over sin is something that is very fundamental to the Christian life. It's how we start our Christian life, and it's how we continue to stay grounded in the Christian life. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, that's especially true for a Christian. Because if we don't look at our lives and understand where we're falling short of God, we won't feel his presence, we won't feel his love, we won't feel his joy, we won't feel his peace. This mourning over sin, this repenting over the wrong that we've done, is still vital. It's how we start, and it's how we continue in our relationship with God. Because although we've been saved by grace, although we've been entered into a relationship with God, although we're now a part of his family, we can affect that day-to-day relationship through our sin. So we grieve over our own sin. We mourn as well. Now, nobody likes to mourn, right? Now, you might be contrary, like I am, and think, well, I can think of some people that are just sad sacks. They're the Eeyores of life, right? They go outside today, sun's shining, they'd be like, I don't know. It's probably going to rain later, right? We know people like that, but most of the time, people don't like to grieve, right? It, it, they don't like to mourn. It, 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 it affects us, and we, we can sometimes feel it like a gloom hanging over us, and we want to get out of it, and sometimes we have trouble getting out of it. So, although I'm um, you know, exaggerating, I'm exaggerating for a point, because most of us don't like to mourn. And here, in the kingdom of Persia, in the king's gate in the palace, it is absolutely forbidden. The king does not want anybody to bring him down. It's like going to a press conference in front of the White House and somebody asking a question, well, what about gas prices? Oh, you know, gas prices aren't that bad, right? It's all defensive, and it's all sunshine, and it's, you know, you just misunderstand the situation, you poor, ignorant slobs. And I'm not just saying that because there's a Democrat in the White House. It happens regardless if it's a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, a Libertarian, it doesn't matter. They're all trying to present the best view possible. Well, that's what's happening in the, in the Citadel in Susa. 
You don't want to bring the king down. In fact, we have another example of this in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. And uh, Nehemiah is upset because he hears the state of Jerusalem when the exiles get back. And he is extremely sad, and he cries out to God. And then he comes into the king's presence, and he's trying not to be sad, but the king notices he's sad, and he says, Nehemiah is what's wrong. And Nehemiah is fearful because you don't come into the king's presence sad. That's not right. That's not allowed. And that's what we have here. King doesn't want anybody bringing him down. You come in, you are full of sunshine, you're full of good news, or it's off with your head. All right. Nobody likes to mourn, but when we do mourn, Mourning can lead to fasting. Okay? So we see that happening in the passage here and we find it other places in Scripture. When Saul and Jonathan were killed, David and the rest of the nation, in 2 Samuel 1.12, they mourned and they wept and fasted until evening for Saul, the king, and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. They fasted. Mourning led to fasting. And with, with Nehemiah, when he heard about the state of Jerusalem, that the walls were down, in Nehemiah 1.4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Mourning and fasting sometimes often go together, especially in the Bible, and we see that happening in our passage today. So why is fasting important? Well, I think it's important for two basic reasons. One is that fasting implies God. Okay? And this section in Esther comes the closest to acknowledging God. We, we talked at the very beginning how God is hidden in Esther, and that gives us some clues for how we're supposed to interpret the book. I mean, why would a book that doesn't mention God be in the Bible? Well, because even though it doesn't mention God, God is continually behind the scenes. I spent a whole sermon a few weeks back talking about all of the coincidences that happen in the book of Esther. Really. Coincidence after coincidence after coincidence, and God's people just happen to get saved. Well, is that the way things really work? Or is God working behind the scenes? And here we come the closest to seeing God in the book of Esther. It's the closest Esther comes to acknowledging God. And for example, Esther 4.14, Mordecai says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. How? How? Well, God's going to raise somebody up if you're not willing to do it. God is there. God is at work. And when you think about it, fasting shows us that God is there and that they're acknowledging God and crying out to him even though they don't mention it specifically in the book of Esther. Because what is the point of fasting? What is the point? Just a way of showing you're sorrowful, just a way of expressing solidarity with everybody else? Is it a diet? No! It serves no purpose unless there's an underlying spiritual reason. Fasting is to acknowledge God. Fasting is to humble yourself before Him. Fasting is to recognize your need for Him above and beyond everything else. And Scripture affirms this relational aspect to fasting. When the people in captivity, you know, people who, you know, we talked about how the Jews here in, uh, in Persia are, are the ones that stayed behind after a significant um, uh, amount of them were allowed to go back to the promised land. Well, before they were allowed to go back to the promised land, they were in captivity. You know, they... they Jewish nation was divided in two, a northern kingdom of Israel, a southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom was taken away by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom by the Babylonians, and here come the Persians, and the Persians let, let them go back if they want to, but some are still in Persia, right? Well, during the time they were in captivity, they were supposed to fast. 
They were supposed to fast on a couple of days a week. And the reason they were supposed to fast is to express their devotion to God and to acknowledge the fact that they had failed before him. The problem is, it just became rote after a while. Think about it. You might remember for a year or two, but 5, 10, 15, 20, 70 years? The people just fasted because it was habit, because it was customary. Why so many people perhaps go to church and participate in the readings and the prayers and the things. It's just tradition. Well, God says this to his prophet in Zechariah 7, 4 through 5. Say to all the people of the land and the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and the seventh for those 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? Was it for me? Did you do it for me? Fasting was supposed to be relational. Fasting was supposed to acknowledge God. Fasting was not just supposed to be something that was done. And when the Jews here are fasting, they're doing it for a purpose. They're doing it because they're crying out to God. Because fasting not only implies God, fasting implies prayer. Prayer. And we read this throughout Scripture. In Joel 1 through 14, once again, or Joel 1, 14, once again, going back to the whole idea of the locust plague and it, it foreshadowing the day of the Lord, in Joel 1, 14, the people are called, called out to consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Consecrate a fast, call an assembly, cry out to God. And then Nehemiah, same passage we read before, kind of led us right into this. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and what? Praying before the God of heaven. And we see this in the early church even, in Acts 14.23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. It shouldn't surprise us that prayer and fasting are linked because God's people are always called to pray. And if fasting is a way to acknowledge our relationship with God and acknowledge our dependence upon him and our need for him, then it's only fitting that fasting and prayer would come together. But prayer is something we're called to do. I mean, when Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 5, was getting ready to introduce the idea of how to pray, he didn't say, if you pray. You know what he said? When you pray. When you pray. We're expected to pray. In fact, Paul perhaps takes it a step further in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. We are called to be involved in prayer. So how do we pray? I'm glad you asked. Jesus gave us the sample prayers, I already said, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. And this is what he said. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I don't want to get into every line of that prayer right now, but I I do want to suggest there are four things here that are important for our prayer lives. The first is that we recognize that prayer is communal. It's not just about us. I mean, we can fall into that trap sometimes, especially when we're having difficulty. We cry out to God because we're in pain. We cry out to God because we're struggling. We cry out to God because we're experiencing difficult circumstances in our lives. But if we truly recognize that we're in a part of community, even in our crying out for God, the Spirit will bring to our minds others who are experiencing difficulties as well. So prayer should always be communal. Did you know what Jesus said? Our Father... Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. It's not just about me. It's always about us when we pray. And prayer praises God. You know, we don't just go to God 
with what we need, we come to him acknowledging who he is and our relationship with him and how awesome and, and wonderful he is and that we can even come to him in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer praises God. And prayer recognizes physical needs, right? Give us this day our daily bread. But sometimes it seems that's all we ever pray about when we pray. It's for physical needs. When we're also called upon to recognize spiritual needs. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. I think it's kind of interesting that he gives us you know, one line, give us our daily bread that deals with physical needs, but so many others that deal with spiritual needs. And yet we tend to reverse that in prayer. Now, I will say this. It's probably natural for us to do that in times when we're involved in public and corporate prayer. Because sometimes when you want to pray for somebody's spiritual, mental, emotional needs, you don't necessarily want to air that out in front of everybody else. So maybe it's natural, but when we pray in private or when we pray with a prayer partner, we should also be praying for spiritual needs as well as for physical needs. And the reason we have to do this is because there is a real benefit to prayer. And we find that benefit in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. We read there, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We pray because we know it brings peace. And with a community that is struggling, with a community that is facing calamity, with a community that has just been told the king doesn't care about you, he's allowing anybody in the nation who wants you to take up arms against you, when the community recognizes the need and they mourn, they go to God in prayer, and God promises that he will help them feel his peace. So it's only natural that the mourning would lead to fasting and the fasting would lead to prayer. And although we don't have it explicitly mentioned in this passage, the fasting is for God and the prayer is for peace and they desperately need to feel that peace just as we do in this life. And that's why when we go back to the Sermon on the Mount, when we go back to Jesus' words in the Beatitudes, when we go back to blessed are those who mourn, we understand how it finishes now because you remember how it finishes? Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Comforted. Because the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus when we pray. So the mourning can lead to fasting. But the mourning and fasting should lead to prayer. And the prayer leads to comfort. So while mourning is normal, while mourning is universal, we have to take it to God in prayer when we mourn. Because that is the only way we will have comfort and that is the only way we have peace. And even though it's not explicitly stated that way in the passage, that's what the entire Jewish people are doing. All of them, that's what they're doing. They need comfort. They need peace. They're looking for salvation. So what do they do? They mourn. They fast. They acknowledge God and they pray. Because that's what fasting is about. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, first of all, for the book of Esther because the reminder that you are there working things out behind the scenes is just so important for us in this day and age. Because so many things seem completely and totally out of control. And there are a lot of times in our lives we get angry. But help us to not just be angry, Lord. Help us to grieve. Help us to mourn 
for the calamity we see, for the sin that we see, for the sin that we ourselves do, because that's, that's the first step in recognizing our need for you. And help us to turn that mourning into prayer. I don't know if any of us here fast, or any of us will plan on fasting, or will fast, but beyond that, the one thing that we have to do, the one thing we're absolutely called to do, the one thing that's expected of us to do is to pray. We are to pray without ceasing. Jesus said, when you pray, help us, Lord, in our prayers to bring all of our concerns to you, not just ours, but the ones about the world, the ones about our brothers and sisters, the ones about those who need to know you. Help us to bring those prayers to you, Lord, because only in acknowledging your sovereignty, only in recognizing your care, only in bringing our concerns to you do we lift that burden up to you and allow you to carry it for us so that we can feel your peace. Help us, Lord, because we desperately need to know your peace. Help us, Lord, because we, we, we mourn and we get angry and we do all these things. Help us, Lord, to go beyond that and to bring it to you because you are the God of all comfort. Help us, dear Heavenly Father. Help us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.